There once was a dream. A dream where children could go and play and meet each other online. A dream of safety for children from the outside world. A dream of a world free of advertisements. A dream called Club Penguin. First of all, a disclaimer. I have never personally played Club Penguin myself. I come into this world as a neutral observer, and I want to document its history for the future. Now, Club Penguin is many things. A home, a place where friends were made, a place of memories that will never go away. The history and legacy of Club Penguin is far-reaching. It will forever be remembered. But how did Club Penguin become so influential? And what led to its unfortunate shutdown? Before we can answer this, we must go back to when the idea of Club Penguin began. Lance Prieve, the father of Club Penguin, was entirely invested in creating games around the Millennium Shift, where he would work on making his games in his spare time. One of the first games he created was Snow Blasters, using Flash 4 technology, which was new at that time. The game, unfortunately, was never finished, but it was a prototype, and it also laid the foundation for the next game called Experimental Penguins or the more well-known name Penguin Chat 1. And you can immediately see similarities between it and Club Penguin in terms of its chat system, throwing snowballs, and moving around the map. And of course, the character model. The game was released to not so much of a success as the game was taken down after less than a year. Penguin Chat 2 to 5 would be released, adding more elements in each installment which would lead to the creation of Club Penguin. But why penguins? Well, according to sources, while Pre was working on computer games for children, he happened to glance at a far side cartoon featuring penguins that was sitting on his desk, which in turn inspired him. And you can clearly see the similarities between this comic and Snow Blasters. Now Preev had had the idea of creating Club Penguin for many years, but the issue was time. While working on other jobs left him only a few hours a day to work on the game. And according to his estimation, the game would take 5 years to develop. He was later joined by two friends, Lane Merrifield and Dave Crisco, who banded together and created the new company, New Horizon Interactive. They finished the game in only 3 months instead of the planned 5 years. One of the main reasons why they wanted to develop Club Penguin in the first place was that there were no real safe social networking sites for children during this time. So instead, they wanted to create said safe space for children to socialize and play in without any advertisements baiting them. And this was due to mainly two things. First, kids. According to them, a lot of research shows how impressionable kids are, which is why so many companies intentionally focus on a lot of advertisements and commercials towards children. And I mean, come on, just watch any toy commercial. A man has fallen into the river in Lego City. Start the new rescue helicopter. Hey, build the helicopter. And off to the rescue. Prepare the lifeline. Lower the, the issue though is, when it comes to advertisements on the internet, you know, such as the classic You have won a brand new iPhone, just type in your information and blah 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 And click here to play this really cool game, which is nothing like the advertisement says But it was more about the ad jumping Kids had no idea what they clicked on, and if you click on one ad you and you click on the next ad and you, you keep on ad jumping more and more. And in some cases you could unfortunately get into adult places of the internet. And let's just say I went to places I should not have been on by clicking on ads. The game would also include heavy monitoring and moderation to prevent inappropriate behavior, and there's even a speedrun in getting banned from Club Penguin, if you believe it. The three co-creators self-financed the development cycle, paying out of their own pockets and giving them 100% ownership of the game and the company. 
Understanding how different the internet environment and culture was back in 2005 is essential to understand all of this. This was before most online games were out, as most games just needed a third party program to play online, and furthermore, many of these games did not have a high requirement to install and play them. And this was especially significant for younger children and teenagers who did not have much money to spend on different standalone games or a decent computer. So games like Hubba Hotel, RuneScape and Club Penguin were perfect options during this time. And lastly, many companies have tried to make a chat based game for children for a long time but they have yet to create one successfully. The Club Penguin team wanted to develop a chat based game like a social network before you know the giants such as Facebook and Instagram were invented. Merrifield writes as follows. Our whole theory was first of all kids don't act the same way as adults. They don't want to be entertained the same way as adults. Their whole social structure, they spend all day with them. It's called school. And that is the way that they interact with their friends. And remember, back in 2005, this was in the era of decentralization of the web. Meaning Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, everything that you almost have today were non-existent. And many people instead used different chat rooms inside of games to communicate with each other. And this is a little bit of a side story, but it's so interesting when you read about it. Apparently, the trio contacted Yahoo, since, you know, Yahoo Games was a big thing back then and asked if they were interested in buying Club Penguin and Yahoo legit answered with this. They said, sure, we'll have a meeting. We showed the game to them. No interest. We got 10 minutes in and they said, listen, this is done. No one is ever going to play this. Yeah, true words. Club Penguin officially opened its servers for the first time on the 24th of October 2005. It started with 15,000 users who had been in the beta testing, and this would later grow to 1.4 million by March, so just a half a year, and this was an unprecedented growth during this time of the internet. It would later increase to 3.9 million by its second year which was even mentioned in the New York Times. They were advertising the game as being a safe space for children. And interestingly enough, according to Lane Merrifield, the player base was more or less a 50-50 split between boys and girls. The player base would become massive in just a few more months, and no one knew how much of a hit the game would become, but the answer would come soon. Club Penguin's active user base exploded shortly after its release, more than doubling monthly numbers, and it soared to unheard of heights in a short span of time. Now, the primary source of revenue was the Club Penguin membership system. However, most people who played Club Penguin played it for free. The Washington Post mentions how about 90%-ish uh, of the player base were non-members. And I just love this as well. According to the Wikipedia article, it created a caste system separating paid from unpaid members. Bro, this is Club Penguin. It's not India or Hub Hotel. However, it kind of makes sense though, since many of the players and the majority were children. And the parents, they were just worried for their children's safety. So users could pay a monthly fee to gain special and unique perks compared to the free-to-play users. As a paid user, you could buy all the clothes and furniture from the catalogs for your igloo, your own outfit, and also puffles, where you could own up to 75 of them. Why? You still needed the in-game coin to buy all of this though, which you could earn in minigames. Non-members could adopt up to two puffles although limited to uh, only certain specific colors. The exciting part was how each puffle had a different uh, personality ascribed to them, such as the original Puffle Blue, who is uh, considered trustworthy, loyal, a team player, and easy to care for, and their favorite toy is a ball. The puffles started off pretty standard, but later turned into more animal-like, with features such as the tabby cat or snowman? 
Uh, many of these newer ones just look plain creepy. There were four membership options to choose from, and it was mostly just duration, so you know, one month, three months, six months, or twelve months. And you could earn certain badges from this. Non-members though were limited to these categories where they could spend their hard-earned coins. Buying colors for their penguin, buying player card backgrounds, buying flags, adopting red and blue puffles, sending postcards, donating to certain events such as coin for change or lighthouse donation, buy certain clothing from catalogs, and buy game upgrades for games. So yeah, there is a vast difference between members and non-members, but it was only cosmetics. All activities, minigames, etc. They were not limited to only members, so no, Club Penguin was not a pay-to-win game. And the customization in this game is interesting. I had never witnessed a game from this time period that had such a significant focus on making your penguin look cool. There was a lot of love coming up with all of these different outfits for the penguins, and as the saying goes, everyone wants to look unique. Chris Hendricks was a moderator and artist who mainly worked on the audio, art, and animation for Club Penguin during the early years of it. He made most of the music in the earlier minigames, and he also said a really interesting thing. There was a huge demand, especially from girls, to include hair as a customization option, which he was firmly against since it would make penguins look too human-like and, you know, penguins don't have any hair. And it would also mess with the headgear if the hair would also be included. In the end though, after being constantly asked or harassed, he added the hair option. But on one condition, it's not hair, they are wigs. Each player also gained access to their own private igloo. You could decorate it with various pieces of furniture, which could be bought by earning coins from, you know, different minigames and such. There were also so different jobs. You could be a tour guide, for example, which meant helping newer players get around the map, help them with the different questions, you know, get them into the game. And becoming a tour guide is interesting, to say the least. And games back then were quite serious when it came to, you know, role-playing as a worker. The requirement to become a guide was having a penguin of the age of 45 days, so, you know, having been a member or played a game at least for 45 days. You also had to answer seven randomized questions about the game correctly. The reward was getting paid in extra coins each month. Again, these requirements are more demanding than some real-life work today. <laughs> There were also regular competitions to who had the best iglo or outfit where the winner would be announced in the Penguin Times. More about that later. And you could win as much as 10,000 coins. So they really included the community in all of these contests. And now the catalogs. Oh, I can't talk about these catalogs forever. They are so beautiful. They are released each year or each month promoting different outfits, furniture, and accessories. The content of these would change drastically in the Disney era. And looking at some of the art from these catalogs, the drip is out of this world. And it took some time for Club Penguin to find its stride here. It started off very basic and then it became more fashionable. I don't think many other games have succeeded in replicating this formula. Now, just a small tangent about the puffles. They were more or less digital Tamaguchis or, you know, virtual pets that you could adopt. You can feed them play and walk with them throughout Club Penguin. And, but an interesting part though is, if you did not take care of your puffles, they would run away, leaving you a farewell note. There were also a lot of private parties inside people's custom-made igloos, where the members who had the bigger ones, the cooler ones, and packed with furniture were quite popular, compared to someone who just had a uh, hole in the middle of the house. So it was not that unusual that just random people came visiting your iglo and they leave. The Penguin Times. Club Penguin also had an in-game newspaper released weekly, 
where news such as new content, secrets and lore would be revealed. And one of the most fantastic things is that it included a poem section, comic section and a joke section. And the last three were made entirely by the player base. And it kind of gives you this nostalgic feeling of, you know, your elementary school's uh, newspaper. And you can tell a lot of love went into this project. Here is an example of a poem that was published in the Penguin Times. Snowballs here, snowballs there. Snowballs just flying everywhere. One hit my ear, so I couldn't hear. For at least two days or so. So whenever I see balls of snow, I think, oh no. I Should Go, by Leo the Peng. There are also, you know, different funny comics, and these look, uh, yeah, that looks like early 2000. The joke bits are hit or miss, but again, you know, early internet. Memes were not, you know, in the high stride yet. Aunt Arctic was the newspaper's editor-in-chief, and its formal help columnist for the advice column, Ask Aunt Arctic, where players could submit specific questions about, you know, anything about the game, and some would then be handpicked and answered by Aunt Arctic each week. Now, Club Penguin also hosted official events and parties throughout the year. For example, they hosted at least one monthly party, giving, you know, one free clothing item to paying and free-to-play members. Uh, some parties were only for paying members though, but these were few in between. And there were so many events based on different holidays, you know, such as Halloween, Christmas, Valentine's, Olympics, etc. And during these days there were always some new content to explore and take part of. For example, in the Halloween event, you can collect candy spread throughout the island. You gain a riddle and a clue as to where to find each candy piece. And this was before every piece of information was instantly typed to the web. So if you wanted to gain all the pieces, you had to be quite witty. Um, there were also more themed events, you know, such as Music Jam, Adventure Party, Puffle Party and Medieval Party. And during each event, it was also possible to exchange your coins in the Club Penguin's virtual charity fundraiser, which coincided with different events. And this exchange lasted for about two weeks. Players could donate their virtual coins and choose one of three different charitable causes. Sick children, the environment, and children in developing countries. The donation amount ranged from 100 to 10,000 virtual coins that you could donate. And at the end of each event, all of the donations would be summarized and a portion of real life money would be distributed to each cause based on the amount of virtual coins donated to them. The different fundraisers were quite successful, garnering enough coins to make a $1 million donation to the Worldwide Fund for Nature, the Elizabeth Glaser Pediatric AIDS Foundation, and Free the Children. The event saw participation from 2.5 million players in both the 2007 and 2008 campaigns. And just like the creator's vision, they wanted children to learn about different societal issues and how they could help. The Club Penguin community has the will and the power to keep changing the world. So, talk to your friends and family, share ideas and take the first step. It's as easy as collecting cans of food for your community or raising money for causes you believe in. Big and small, flippers and feet, together we are changing the world. Club Penguin had a reputation for being one of the strictest games regarding rules against bullying, inappropriate language and behavior, where many words were censored due to the ultimate safe chat, a list of different pre-written sentences or emotes. Club Penguin also had active moderators through every server. The system would also automatically block certain words, inappropriate usernames, Telephone numbers and email addresses were also blocked, you know, for obvious reasons. And the moderators during this time were also given the rank of EPF, Elite Penguin Force, where they searched the servers for rule breakers and breaking the rules could result in a 24 hour ban depending on the crime. Its security measures were so thorough that they were compared to those of a Orwellian dystopia. We are one people. One resolve, one cause. Our enemies shall talk themselves. 
And this is also why it became a meme to start in trying to speedrun getting banned in Club Penguin in the later years. And I think the record today sits at uh, 33 seconds. One of the main reasons why the moderators were so effective was due to their diligence, and that they also shared the same vision as the creators and passion for upholding a safe space for children. Since some children, no matter how rough of a day they had in school or how complicated their lives were, they would not be subject to the same thing in Club Penguin. Club Penguin reportedly spends, or spent rather, 10 to 15 million dollars a year on just moderation alone. They sacrificed a lot of resources to keep the servers safe. And this is also why later on the private servers did not do this at all. And of course, as in any other MMO game, there were scams. A lot of scams. I think most people who played MMOs, you know, the Maple Story, RuneScape, WoW, etc., got uh, conned or tricked into losing all of your gold or even your account, or the worst case scenario, real life money. Club Penguin, however, had more scams that focus on, you know, free coin duplicates, how to get all clothes in the game, and these scam websites that you found through a link often required you to type in all of your personal information and in return you get an infected computer and your account is gone. Now before continuing, let's review what you could actually do in Club Penguin. One of the game's main features was the different minigames, storylines and just socializing. One of the most memorable aspects of the game was the aesthetics, art, music, and just traveling around Club Penguin for the first time experiencing all it had to offer. And there was a theater where players tried to create plays, which mainly was just chaos because good luck trying to direct a bunch of kids doing a play. There was also the Italian pizza parlor, in where people hang out, play some music, you know, play the pizza minigame, or even go on dates. And man, the music just makes you want to snap your fingers. You could also visit the iceberg, and it became a fairly popular spot in Club Penguin, but for the wrong reasons. According to urban legends, a specific iceberg could be flipped if enough people stood on the edge and drilled. No one really knows who started this rumor, but the developers rejoiced in it and accepted it and started to spread it even more. The most famous and most popular area of the map was the town. And this was primarily because this is where everyone who logged in starts. It was usually just full of people spamming emotes, throwing snowballs at each other, or just advertising their iglos. The town area also, you know, had a coffee shop where mini games such as the bean counters were. The place was also mostly just used, you know, for chilling, drinking some sweet cocoa with extra marshmallows, and uh, the nightclub, as the name says, was a place where people gathered to party. It also hosted the mini games, dance contest, and sound studio. Oh, and who can forget? The infamous penguin dance. <music> Lastly, there was a clothes shop where you could check out the catalogs and buy some new clothes. Many outfits were also displayed showing how they would look in the game. Now, the minigames. There were a ton of different minigames throughout Club Penguin. There were a ton of different minigames throughout Club Penguin's lifespan, and most of them are quite good, and a few are mixed, and perhaps one or two are bad. But just look at this list. It's enormous. Shall we talk a little bit about these minigames? So, first up is the Pizzatron 3000. So, the game's goal is to garnish pizzas with certain toppings. And this changes with every pizza you get. And I think there are 40 pizzas in total. And the conveyor belt goes faster and faster with each pizza you succeed in making. The garnish options also increase with each pizza, making it harder. So by the end, it's challenging and it's stressful. And I can't imagine playing this game back in a day when the internet was, you know, slow and laggy. For many people, this minigame is an instant classic and a favorite. The 
There were also a few multiplayer games such as Sled Race, where you could challenge three other players to a race where the goal was to slide down the hill the fastest. There were four different tracks you could choose from, and they were all different. There are many obstructions such as logs, trees and stumps. Ice patches makes you go faster and bumps lets you bounce bounce. And if you won, you won some extra coins. And bragging rights of course. It's a basic premise, but an instant classic. Mancala. Puffle Roundup. This one is a mess. Your goal is to round up all the puffles into a square space, and you have 120 seconds to round them all up. Some puffles are more challenging to catch than others, some are faster depending on the puffle, and this one might be one of the worst minigames in Club Penguin, and it's well... It's pretty boring, and it does not have good replayability. There's also Dance Contests, which is a ripoff from Dance Dance Revolution or Guitar Hero, and you can choose a song and a difficulty where you must click the corresponding arrow and time it with the screen. And on a harder difficulty, it gets way too hard. And as, uh, and as I said earlier in the Pizzatron minigame, if you had a shitty internet or bad computer, good luck buddy. And lastly, we need to talk about the most famous minigame, Card Jitsu. Players had been teased for quite some time, with a building far away in the distant mountains and rumors in newspapers popping up. And when it finally opened, it would Introduce a new card game. It started as a myth, born out of the shadows. A mysterious figure appeared to train those willing in the ancient art of card jitsu. This journey requires patience, practice, power, and hot sauce. Lots of hot sauce. Alright, first of all, I know there's massive lore behind Karjitsu, especially in the latter part of Club Penguin's existence, and I'm only going to focus on the actual minigame here. After speaking with the Temple Sensei, he gives you a basic starter deck. They also include a ranking system with belts, you know, where the basic belt is white and the uh, hardest belt was black. The belts are divided into three different levels with nine belts in total. The game works as follows. You are handed a certain amount of cards, randomized. There are three different types of elements, water, fire, and ice. So it's an advanced version of rock, paper, scissor. And every card had its own unique animation which looks fun and gorgeous. I just love it. To win the game, you need to win with three sets of the same element. For example, winning three rounds with three fire cards would earn you a win. This game was the most popular out of all of them. It got so popular that they even created a physical card replica of the cards being sold. Now, there's also the different storylines, and probably the one that's most famous in Club Penguin was during the event Operation Blackout in 2012. On November 15th, when the unthinkable happens, gear up. Infiltrate Herbert's fortress. Secret agents, you have your orders. <laughs> Save the island. And there was a whole new complete storyline where you had to stop the evil polar bear named Herbert, who wants all the warmth for himself, so he constructs a giant beam that shoots a laser into the sky to block out all the sun, which in turn engulfs the rest of Club Penguin Island. Basically, he took control of Club Penguin, inserting himself into the stage play, every catalog, newspaper, minigames, and they were just no longer there. And he even took over the chat. And so this was a huge thing for many, and every single day a new mission would unlock with voice acting. And this was a first timer, you even had dialogue options, and I don't think there was a coincidence that 2012 was the year that Club Penguin peaked, both in players and quality. And with Club Penguin becoming a cult phenomenon, and too big for just three guys who had no history with advertising or franchising, they needed someone who had that experience. Which leads us to... Uh... 
In August of 2007, Disney came forward and was interested in buying Club Penguin as part of their new investments in the online sphere. They offered $350 million for the initial purchase and a $350 million bonus if specific targets were met by 2009. The acquisition by Disney was surprising for many because the co-founders of Club Penguin had previously rejected advertising offers and other companies trying to buy Club Penguin. Now, Lane Merrifield had stated that they tried to sell Club Penguin to Disney earlier for only $4 million, and the deal was nearly closed, but Disney backed off at the last second because they said, quote, if we wanted something like this, we would just build it ourselves. Thanks. But no thanks. So Disney lost a lot of money not taking that deal earlier. Thanks, man. I'm gonna have a beer. <laughs> this is fun. Take it easy, Kev. Hey, uh, thanks, Jordan. Thanks a lot. Fuck! Yeah! Fuck! Yeah! Fuck! Yeah! Fuck! Yeah! Fuck! But so why sell it to Disney out of all the companies? Well, first of all, Disney is one of the most kid-friendly companies, creating the most famous children's movies and cartoons and being an animation giant. And before you come at me for this, remember this was Disney in 2007, before it became the current Leviathan that absorbs every company it can get its mittens on. Being partnered with Disney felt like a safe bet and an honor. It's also the fact that the creators knew they needed to go global with the game, since they could not provide specific languages for countries outside of the United States. And this was primarily due to the number of players logged in outside of America. Because Club Penguin was mainly a game for children, and most children who perhaps did not have good English skills, it would just minimize their Club Penguin experience. There was also a massive demand for physical Club Penguin merchandise, and these sold off really well and fast, making well over 5 to 6 million dollars just selling these tiny stuffed puffles. The issue was that the team needed more experience in merchandising and franchising. The game had simply just grown too big for them to handle. The team understood this and did not want any other distractions besides focusing on improving the actual game. So the main trio sat down. No stakeholders or shareholders, you know, just the three of them. So there were six different companies they could try and sell to, if they met the team's requirements. These fell through one by one, Disney was not even the company that had the highest bid for Club Penguin, but they knew Disney had experience and expertise in making toys and TV shows, and Disney also had offices all around the world, so instead of having to create new offices around the world, they could just use Disney's existing ones. It was a good deal for some time, and they estimate that Disney sped up Club Penguin's international growth by a year or two. When Disney bought the company, Club Penguin had 11 to 12 million users, where 700,000 of them were paying members. This generated 40 million dollars in annual revenue. Club Penguin at the time was also ranked 8 in the most popular social networking sites. A year after Disney had purchased Club Penguin, the player base had increased by over 300%. And initially, everything was going fine with Disney. The player growth was steady, Club Penguin was now adapting into a franchise with different games, books, TV specials, an anniversary song. Today is your birthday, birthday. Everyone can wait, can wait. Cracks would start to show though when Disney began to promote their own new films and shows by holding themed events to celebrate their films' releases. Many props from these movies and shows would be added into the catalog. Also, the idea that there would be no advertisements in Club Penguin was broken when Disney started to use the platform to promote their movies. Under Disney's leadership, Club Penguin also opened an online store where people could buy physical merchandise such as you know, t-shirts, stuffed puffles, keychains, gift cards, and it would later expand into include different penguins being sold, creating a new source of revenue that was much needed. Club Penguin did not have to advertise their game through trailers or anything though, they instead relied on the word of mouth. It was also during Disney's reign that the design of Club Penguin, in essence, would change. Five times. There is a stark contrast between the art style of the old Club Penguin and the newer art style. No longer were there any rough edges, 
you know, the penguins being around, they were more streamlined. It looked smooth and modernized, and just everything was changed from the ground up. And the penguins starting to look a little bit human-like and slender. By 2013, Club Penguin had garnered over 200 million registered users. And unfortunately, when you peak, there's only one way left to go. Long live the king. By the start of the 2010s, most households had acquired more powerful computers to play games requiring more specs. Club Penguin was still a Flash game and looked quite uh, old compared to other games by this time. It's also necessary to understand why things started to deteriorate. Club Penguin could only pay for the upkeep of the servers hosting some of the millions of players. And especially the fact that there were no advertisements and only 10% of the player base paying for membership. The subscription model of Club Penguin is one of the most consumer friendly ones I have ever seen and compared to today with all the microtransactions, Modern gaming. it's also just the case that the co-founders, they were never really in it for the money. They wanted to make a game for kids. And the fact that most of Club Penguin's player base was young children also created a problem. Because, well, kids don't make or have much money. There was also a lot of competition on the market now. One of the reasons why Club Penguin was so famous for such a long time was because it was one of the first free-to-play MMOs. New competitions such as League of Legends and also later on their biggest competitor that was going for the same type of audience, Minecraft. Where the only limit is your imagination. Let's go wherever you want to go. Climb the tallest mountains. Lastly, it's essential to understand that even if Club Penguin had impressive numbers in terms of, you know, total registered accounts, it does not translate into active users. So even if you have 200 million registered accounts, you know, maybe only 20% of them are actively playing the game. And there was also another problem. At this point, all the original lead developers had quit the company, wanting to instead focus on their solo careers and not really liking what Disney had done with the company. Disney was now entirely in control of the company without anyone to push back. Dark clouds started to form when in 2015 Disney Interactive started to lay off people from the Clan Penguins Kelowna headquarters due to the game's declining popularity. The company's UK office in Brighton was also shut down. The downsizing would continue as support for the German and Russian versions of the game was closed. Puffle Wild was removed from the App Store and Google Play and almost everything that was a side project of Club Penguin was shut down to focus solely on the main game. In 2017, in a desperation move, Disney wanted to transition Club Penguin from a PC platform to the mobile markets. The new Club Penguin would become Club Penguin Island. Have you heard? There's a one-of-a-kind community where friends and adventures await. And this was a shock for many because the whole player base were, well, based on PC and desktop, and not mobile. And suddenly, changing the hardware felt like too much of a change. This was probably due to the Club Penguin making less money than Disney wanted to, and after seeing the massive success of many other children's mobile games such as Angry Birds, Temple Run, etc., they want to monetize their games even more and to try to increase their player base by moving to the mobile market with a more extensive user base. This video focuses more on Club Penguin, hence I will not go too in depth about Club Penguin Island. Other creators have done far more excellent work on the subjects. Club Penguin Island though opened on March 29, 2017. After initial backlash and a lot of complaints, Disney tried to make some amends by porting the game over to the PC as well, but it was too little, too late. The overall game would shut down in December 20th of 2018, 
And the reason of why it failed? Well, first of all, the game bombards you with advertisements regarding getting a membership. And of course you get the Get 7 days of free trial for free, but if you don't cancel within those 7 days, you will be billed monthly. The catalogs were full on sellouts, where you can choose your favorite franchises and then buy clothes in that franchise and it's just, that's not Club Penguin, that was never Club Penguin. And the game has a in-depth customization clothing system where you can change your belts, buckles, etc. But guess what, you needed to be a member to wear that. And they're hiding the, some mini games behind paid membership. This game tried everything to make some short term money. And playing this game for free is next to impossible because there's nothing to do. It's almost as if walking on the grass or looking at the clouds would cost you money. Ah, uh, now this I can afford. They hid main quests behind a paid wall. And so this is where the story should end, right? The original Club Penguin and Club Penguin Island were shut down. Well, when people crave nostalgia, they will get it one way or another. Because right now, it was the rise of the private servers, which was an interesting time. There were several of them. Club Penguin rewritten. In 2022, Disney filed a copyright infringement lawsuit and the London police went hard on the creator, which makes it even more interesting as to why it took them so long to take down Club Penguin rewritten when Club Penguin Online got taken down much earlier. It was probably due to Disney having already shut down the original Club Penguin and Club Penguin Island, and having seen what the fan reaction was to Blizzard shutting down their fan-made private servers, they knew there would be massive backlash if they killed off another Club Penguin for a second time. On the other hand, the scandal surrounding the fan-made server increased from data breaches, mods dating users, drunken parties, artists on a family friendly discord and just moderation not being up to date and breaking a lot of rules. It survived the longest because it was somewhat moderated and that it was not as bad as the other servers. And shutting down fan made servers is not that unusual. The most famous case being World of Warcraft Classic before the official classic servers were released. A fan-made server called Nostalarius was created and became really popular. The game was 100% free and the owners did not introduce monetization. Blizzard finally decided to file a cease and exist, and the servers were shut down in 2016, with many people feeling disgruntled towards Blizzard. Though only a few years later, Blizzard would launch their version of the game. And Club Penguin Online and Oboe this private server was a mess to say the least. Almost no moderation, the difference was that Club Penguin rewritten focused more on nostalgic content, while online focused more on the modern version of Club Penguin, but with more frequent updates. The issue online did not require a parent to register to join the game. It was also too easy for children to join mature or adult servers, and if you know about Goldshire, then you know how some Club Penguin servers would look like. And obviously due to all the scandals and also the creator of the server being a... yeah... On the 30th of January 2017, it was announced that Club Penguin would be terminated on March 29, 2017, and all the servers with it. All payments and memberships would be cancelled, and all paid members would be notified. During this time, the player count on Club Penguin would rise once again, since it was one of the last times and opportunities to experience it before it's shut down. Most people just want to relive some of their childhood memories. During the last month of Club Penguin, all players will gain free membership until the shutdown of the servers. I have massive respect for the developers and moderators who stayed until the very end of Club Penguin, as they resolved the urban legend flipping of the iceberg.
On the last day, or rather last minutes before the shutdown, players would gather, celebrating their last moments together. And after the shutdown, players would receive an orange message on their screens. The connection has been lost. Thank you for playing Cloud Penguin. Waddle on. Now, the reasons for the shutdown were many. Disney had now owned Club Penguin for 10 years and faced increased competition from other games and companies. And with fewer active players, that means a decrease in revenue. There was also the issue of technology. By 2017, Club Penguin looked really dated compared to its competition. Disney was unwilling to upgrade the graphics and the game, so they had a choice. Invest more money in Club Penguin and change the game from the ground up with improved graphics, or create a whole new game. Disney chose the latter. Lane Merrifield explains really well how they deal with Disney and how they handled Club Penguin during and after his time with the company. I'm really sad with what Disney ended up doing with the world afterwards. I think when I left, we have all the right pieces in place, and naturally, you have new management new leadership that comes in, and then it gets passed along and passed along, it just ended up becoming a shell of what it was. I didn't really have the energy to keep trying to protect it and keep its purity intact. For Disney, brands are invented in movies and they are invented in TV, they are not invented in the internet. For Disney, the internet was a marketing vehicle, and so when I look at what was going on before Club Penguin, before they shut it down, it was really sad to watch, because it was basically a marketing vehicle for their movies. Even though it was still generating a healthy amount of revenue, they had layered on so many internal costs, it was on now the Disney servers and Disney Cloud paying for it. Even though it was, I think at the time they shut it down, it was still generating 30 to 40 million dollars a year. They had weighed down so much with internal costs, that it still wasn't profitable. Both Lance and I tried to repurchase it, we have tried to license it back and no joy, they would rather keep it shut down. I understand why Disney is not doing it, it's a no win situation for them. Furthermore, if they would license it back and it fail again, it would look bad on Disney's part as they still own the franchise. It was no longer about what the players wanted, it was about what Disney wanted. Maybe in the future, Disney will let go of the IP and we might get a Club Penguin classic or revival after seeing you know, the whole and huge success of WAP Classic. Alright, to summarize, there are many reasons as to why Club Penguin was shut down. Not enough monetization, not enough new users and an aging fanbase, Disney buying the company, the original creators leaving, and shutting down Club Penguin for a phone game. If I had to choose the biggest reason, it's probably Disney taking over, and rather than focusing on consumer feedback and sharing the original trio's vision, they instead turn it into a game used for marketing other Disney products. Club Penguin was something unique that will be remembered, something people will look back on with fond memories. There once was a dream. A dream called Club Penguin. Thank you guys so much for watching, feel free to point out any mistakes regarding Club Penguin that I made or just plain missed. Or you know if the audio or video in general could have been better, your feedback is most welcome because I want to create a better product for you guys. See you next time guys, have a good one.